Hello, welcome to Quarantine. I'm Science Dad. And I'm Math Mom. Of course. You, some of you might think that something's a little different today, but no, I assure you, this is the way it's been all the time. So it's great to see everybody who has chimed in. I'm feeling so sciencey today. Oh. Now I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. People are, are tuning in from all over, and it's fun to see you guys. Uh, get, getting into the chat, getting into things. I wanted to start off with a question for you today. And so most of us are spending a lot more time at home and it might be easy to be kind of lazy and not, not do as much. So I'm curious, what are you doing to improve yourself during this time? So are you exercising more? Are you reading more books? I know you're tuning into quarantine. That's that's nice. So yeah, let, let us know in the chat, what, it, what are you doing to, to make yourself a better person or to learn more because I think it would be kind of sad if at the the end of this extended break if we we weren't better people than when we started we should always be working to improve ourselves so I want to want to have you guys weigh in in the chat and we'll see what we're doing so Josie I, says she's making making blankets learning how to make blankets uh, pixels drawing a lot reading ah, a art. lot Karen is reading Biking. Love cat meows. Reading more too. Schoolwork. Oh, the coding. Coming, playing uh, soccer. Okay, do, do, awesome. doing more walks. Yeah. A book report. Book report. Playing outside. Playing. Yeah. Learning how to rollerblade. Doing yeah. crafts. Awesome guys. Ooh, something with a hover car. Learning the piano. Drawing. Learning anime. Jumping on the trampoline. Sewing. Oh, this is great, you guys. A good variety of activities. Some, some I love online it. Online school there. Yeah. It, just because just cause we're home doesn't mean we can't be, be learning and growing. And yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see. So yeah. what are you doing to improve yourself, math dad? Yeah. Well, okay. Let, let me I mention. mean, math, uh, ma science dad. So science dad. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you one little thing I've been doing a lot better. I have been very good at washing my hands. Because you know what? Sometimes I just wouldn't wash them that well, or it just it wasn't taking as much time to actually get every little bit of my fingers between the fingers all soapy. And you know, one of the best things we can do to stay healthy and not spread germs is to wash our hands better. And I thought, boy, if I'm ever gonna get good at washing hands, now is the time. So I wanna make that a habit so that they always wash them super well every time. And I hope that others are doing that as well because we got to do our part to, to not spread the germs. All right. I love the variety of, of activities cooking. that I'm seeing in the chat. Yeah, it's fantastic. People are cooking and doing more writing. Oh, that, that's fun. And definitely some games are going on. I hope we're having fun during this break. That, that, that's important. To, speaking of fun, today we've got some fun stuff planned. That's right. So for our, our plan for the day, maybe... Did I upload anything? Uh, uh, yes, I did upload my, <laughs> we're doing awesome art. This is our first hour. We'll, we'll do a, a science lesson with, uh, we're gonna talk about the earth and its shape. Do fact or fiction, we'll get a math lesson in there with Math Mom and our engineering challenge. We'll build, build some stuff. Um, I'm pretty excited. So I'm going to try to share my screen here and look at some of the great artwork that came in. And I have to say this morning I checked and it was still coming in really rapidly. Go to application window and then. Oh, I did it wrong. <laughs> you did it just a different way. Oh man. So the, we've had more than 40 states represented the last time I looked and two provinces from Canada and another country as well with Italy. So, oh, we well, need to. Go back to the beginning. Yes. So which state do you think Science Dad was represented the most? Oh boy, which state? I mean, California has the most people and it's the first one here. So I, I'm gonna get my guess is California. We definitely had the most entries come in from California. And I have to say, I learned some new things looking at all of the fantastic art that came in. So I loved these drawings, Alexis and Hannah, great job. So California is famous for Hollywood, okay. obviously. Apparently it's the golden state. I, I didn't know that. It is, and the quail and the flower are there. And then- I, I think it would be a very difficult state to draw without a map to look at. That, it, that it would be more challenging line. to freehand, yeah. yeah. Ah, more Cal. Ah, I like California written along the border. Yeah, yeah, I like Clover. that. And then, uh, you know, more representation of the the redwoods. It's really famous for its beautiful scenery. Traced out the whole U.S. Good job, Lark yeah. and Jordan. All right. 
the ocean, bald eagle, and home reminded jo this person of Jo Jo Jojo. Jo jo yeah. And then I, I loved I loved Lily's drawing as well. So th yeah. that was this was some of the art that represented California. And you know what reminds you of home can be can be a variety of things. There certainly all states have things they're famous for. <laughs> <laughs> the song the song is there. And look, the mom is in agreement. They're doing the great <laughs> dance there. <laughs> Ooh, Minnesota. Yes, Minnesota and Utah. Good job, you guys, with that art. We had Oklahoma. And I thought this one was colored in beautifully. Yeah, it is. And Idaho, famous for its potatoes. Go that's white. Where, I'm from Idaho. Yep, Ooh. that's where Math Dad grew up. Ooh, we've got Washington. Yeah, Walla Walla, Washington. <laughs> Another Idaho representation in Utah, and I love that she. So the, uh, Idaho, there was an earthquake. There was a big earthquake in Idaho uh, 6 yesterday. Six point five. Yep. Yeah. It was not over Yellowstone. I saw a few people saying it was right over Yellowstone. It's quite far away from Yellowstone, but yeah, big earthquake yesterday. So, yeah. hope hopefully, if you were in Idaho, you didn't have anything fall off the shelves and break, and everything's good. That's right. I've got Kentucky, Kentucky. the bluegrass. Pennsylvania. Yeah, we That's, lived in Pennsylvania for a few years. We did. We did. Two of our kids were born in Pennsylvania. Nicely done. New York was the second most popular state. We had a lot of beautiful drawings coming in from New York, which has the Erie Canal and Niagara Falls. And the mm -hmm. first place that women got to vote, too, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, what do we have there? Min Wisconsin. Wisconsin. That's Wisconsin. right. Wisconsin. I say Minnesota. We already saw. I love, um, the, I love the cow. Wisconsin is famous for its cheese. Really good cheese in Wisconsin. Mm, cheese. And the Silver State with you singing the song again and me saying no. <laughs> Kansas, very nicely done, Caroline. And another Pennsylvania, great job, Magnolia. Yeah. And your song again, Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and my song. Good job, Eliana. All right, Eleanor. And Massachusetts. The Massachusetts really has a distinctive shape with the bay. And here's Ohio. Beautiful drawings. I love the drawings that you surrounded Ohio with. In Colorado with the Rockies and Columbine as the state flower. <laughs> and then we've got Minnesota with <laughs> some awesome reptiles and two drawings of Nevada where we live. Yeah, Liam, Amelia. Yeah, and I like loved, yes. loved the Roadrunner and Tortoise in that one. I thought those were great because we do have a lot of Roadrunners and a lot of Tortoises here. That's right. That's oh, Michigan. Michigan. The, the glove in the Upper Peninsula there. That's right. And Nevada with some bighorn sheep. Am I riding a sheep? You are. You are too. A sheep. Oh, <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. In real life, it would not work out super well, but in a drawing, I love it. <laughs> Maryland. <gasps> Maryland. Now that would be the hardest one to draw with their crazy. It, it does have a very interesting order. shape. Yeah. yeah. Kansas. Very nice. I love the farm farm references here. We've got a barn and animals and cotton, wood trees. Massachusetts, with the, yeah. there with the bay and the lobster, Nevada and Texas, and they've got the Springs Preserve there. I've been there to the Springs Preserve. It's a beautiful place. Massachusetts. Yeah, I think Massachusetts is a very, proved to be a very colorful state. Yeah, yeah. And someone who had just moved to Alabama said that this was a great way for them to learn more about their new home. Good job, and then Allison. we also had great entries from Texas. We will pause there and come back to an art show later on. But I have to say, if you have not yet um, hopped on Facebook, you should just take a look. If you click on our album that's pinned to the top of the page, you'll see all of the entries. And they were still, I mean, they were coming in as we were getting ready. I was seeing more and more being added. And it's really fun to just see where everyone is at. We have people all over the US and in provinces of Canada and in other countries in Europe. And it was really fun to see the art. Uh, and well, this might be a good time, Math Mom, to talk about tomorrow's drawing prompt. Oh, yes. Tomorrow's drawing prompt is shadow art. So trace a shadow, and it can be any shadow. I have to say, this one that I did as an example was tricky because I had a lamp behind it, and the lamp didn't cast a clear shadow like the sun does. And then I scribbled over it and then colored in the pattern. But you could even just hold your hand above a piece of paper and trace your hand. Or you could just put your hand on the paper and trace it because underneath your hand, is there a shadow there? Oh, there, there most assuredly. There definitely is. Or you could take your favorite toy and set it up by a window, trace the shadow of your favorite toy, and then color it in. And when you color it in, you could just do stripes 
and then color what's in the shadow differently than the stripes on the outside, however oh. you want to do it. So they could do some really abstract art, or they could tr try to draw it exactly, and it'd be, try it'd be fun to try to guess what something is just from the shadow. Yeah, yeah, the shadows yeah. can often look different, so that's tomorrow's drawing prompt. Well, fun. All, All right. right, it's time for our science lesson with <laughs> Science Dad. So, I'm gonna open up with a question. I want you guys to think about this, and I actually want you to answer this in the comments if you can. And the, my question is, how do we know that Earth is round? How do we know that Earth is round? Yeah. That, uh, that reminds me of a song. I'm singing a song and I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it wrong. And I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> what, what were you that saying? Was, that, was, that was beautiful, huh? Uh, round. I said round. <laughs> oh, round. Oh, like a round of music. I'm, I'm trying to make the connection. <laughs> but okay. Um, I mean, if you look, if you go outside and you look around, it kind of depends on where you live. Some states are really flat. Like the state of Kansas, flat as a pancake, flatter than a pancake. State of Florida, as flat as can be. Um, we live near some mountains, so it might be a lot more obscured as to what the actual shape of the earth is. But if you go out and you look around, what you'll see is it looks pretty darn flat. So why do we say it's round? <laughs> what makes us think that? I mean, like, well, maybe it's a giant ball, really big. Well, it is, that, that, that's true. But how, how do we actually know that? Hmm, so I want you to chime in. What evidence do you have that the Earth is round? And- Some, LeBron said Galileo. Okay. And Heidi said, because it's a planet. Planets. Space-based telescopes. telescopes, you can see it from space. Okay. This is good, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of you were thinking about NASA. You've got pictures of the Earth from outer space. Yes, we absolutely can use that as very strong evidence that the Earth is indeed round. But I want you guys to think back, back in time before NASA, before even the, we traveled the globe, so back before Magellan had sailed all the way around the world. Ooh. How did the ancients know? There was, I've got to find it, it flew up so fast. Boats disappear over the horizon, hole first. <gasps> awesome job, oh. Daniel, that's a great one. Okay, okay. so, so th that right there is some pretty good evidence. It's, it makes you think, wait a minute. Uh, so on a very clear day, if, if you were on say, a huge lake or on the ocean, minimal waves, if you had a, had a telescope, you, usually with your naked eye, it's awfully hard to tell, but on the horizon, when a boat sails out to sea, the bottom of the boat disappears from view before the top of the boat. So if here's your boat that you're watching, when you, it, you lose sight of it, the bottom disappears and then the top. And that's only gonna happen if it's round. If it were flat and it were getting too small to see, it should just get smaller and smaller until you can't see it. But if your surface is round, then you have the bottom disappear first. That's right. But then the, the problem is that Earth is just so big that it's very hard to see th that phenomenon. And Ooh, sunrise is a good connection too. Okay, so got a got sunrise. We see, we see it on, on a globe. It's That's, round because no one's fallen off yet. You know? <laughs> I like that. Th this is pretty good evidence right there that if, if, it, if it were flat, wouldn't there have to be an end? And a lot of people on the Earth have been around a long time. Nobody's ever discovered the end of the Earth. Okay, I, I like that a lot. Um, got the and the the point too that the Moon is around, all the other planets are around. Ah, okay, that's, yeah. that's an interesting observation. So Earth would have to be very different than all the other planets if it if it were flat. So I, I remember having this conversation with my brother. Well, and in particular, I remember talking him telling me that it was, if the sun wasn't going around the earth, that the earth was spinning. And that just blew my mind as a little kid. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, I can go outside and I can see, I, in the morning the sun's over there and then throughout the day it's crossing. And so he was telling me something that went against the evidence of my eyes and my experience. So was my older brother play, playing an April Fool's joke on me or was he not? Well, I had to think about it for a while. So we actually got out a ball and we said, all right, if we're here and if the ball rotates, but the sun stayed in the same place, huh, that kind of actually does fit the theory. The sun would go, would not be in sight any longer. 
And, but then I thought, well, wait, I don't feel like I'm moving. Hmm. It doesn't feel like we're moving. Aha, maybe the sun is moving around us. Well, it turns out we are moving and we're moving pretty fast, but I mean, it's uniform motion. Yeah, we, we just don't feel the change. Just like yeah, when you're driving in a car, you can be driving pretty fast. If you toss a little ball up and down in a car, it doesn't go flying off. The ball just has that frame of motion that comes from being in the car. So, so that becomes our our frame. Thank you. All right. So, let me just. Ooh. So this idea of got telescopes being invented, moons. Somebody says no. Earth is actually was it flat? Oh no. Earth is, Earth is not flat, so yeah. It's not. But I mean, if we just go by the evidence of what we can see, it's not so obvious at first glance. It's the type of thing we have to think through and explore. And as a scientist, we should not just believe everything we are told. I mean, we can hope that what we're being told is the truth, but uh, I can speak as a teacher here. We don't always tell students the truth, or at least not the full truth right away. And um, Math Mom at one point talked about this in a lesson about the different models of the atom. And you know, most schools, when, when we start teaching about atoms, we don't talk about electron clouds or probability density clouds. In, in, instead, yeah, we're teaching this Bohr um, model of the yeah, there's electrons flying around like a planet around the sun. and you know, that's, that's actually a pretty good way of thinking about things and, and conceptualizing those ideas. We're not ready to dive in to the theoretical particle physics at that point. We're just learning and trying to get a foundation. So one, one lesson, is don't just believe something because I tell it to you or your parents tell it to you. And especially on a, a particular day of the year where a lot of pranks get played, <laughs> you, you, you have to be a little more you have skeptical. To be a little more skeptical, yes. All right. So. So do you have a way for us to test this, right? Uh, that, that's right. So we want to go back to the third century BCE, uh, second century BCE, yeah, um, to a mathematician named Eratosthenes, who was able to estimate the circumference of the Earth. So that's, that's our science lesson for today. We're going to see how could you estimate the circumference of a ball. So when we say circumference, we're talking the distance around uh, the, the outer edge. So the, I got, the longest distance around. I, I gotta say, this sounds like kind of a mathy science lesson. Are you sure you're not math dad, science dad? Uh, I, I don't know what would give you that idea. No, <laughs> I, 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 I'm science dad. All right. <clears throat> so this problem's a little bit oversimplified. When we look at a ball this size, we're just like, I don't know, why don't we just put a string around it and measure how long it is? But Back in the day, especially, but the Earth is just way too big. You're not going to find a string that stretches all the way around the Earth. And yeah, definitely, the, yeah, most of the world haven't been discovered at that point or ever ever visited. So, how do we actually find the circumference of the Earth? So, we're going to turn the card around here and talk about this. So, the first thing I want to point out is that the Sun is so far away, so it's, it's a light source, but essentially all the light from the sun is coming from a single direction. And so I'm gonna draw the picture here. The picture will not be to scale, but that, that's just the way we, we need to do it. All right, so I'm going to try to draw the earth. And this setup was, Eratosthenes set up a pole that was, so I'm orienting, got my sun over here letting out sunlight, but all, all the rays are just coming horizontally. So he sets up this pole, and what's going to happen to the shadow of this pole that's directly under the sun? Well, no, no shadow. shadow at all. At noon. At noon, there's no shadow. That's right. At noon, there's, there's no shadow. All right, but he sets up the same pole or one that's identical to it somewhere else. And I'm, I'm drawing these poles nice and big, although if this were the actual Earth, these poles would be hundreds of miles tall. 
so that the scale doesn't work. But now, when the sunlight comes in horizontally, we get a shadow on the ground. All right. And Eratosthenes was able to measure that shadow, he measured the distance between the two poles, poles that were straight up and down, pointing towards the center of the earth. And so I guess I, I should actually draw that very carefully here. So we measured the, the height of the pole, the length of the shadow, and the distance between these towers, and was able to make a calculation of the circumference of the earth based off of just those <laughs> measurements. And he was right, too. Like, it was really, really close, which is amazing, because this was before, I mean, he never traveled more than, a, like, 100 miles from his home. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt, and this was before anyone had ever gone around the earth. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to think of that they were able to do that back then. So the key to why this works has to do with the fact that this angle right here will match this angle up here. So for you... Uh, Geometry students, that's a, alternating interior angles. But yeah, so basically up here, you're gonna get a triangle, especially if the curvature of the earth doesn't come into play on such a small scale, but with this little globe, it curves a little bit. But yeah, you're able to get information about this triangle, which will give you information about this angle. And once you know this angle, you can just figure out what fraction of the total circle is, is included there. So, <coughs> Uh, if you want to do this, or check this out as we go, I have made a Desmos, um, or maybe Math Mom made this. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't remember who made this. Um, but I've, I've got a code for you here. And in this code, oops, we've got a, a, a little bit of a, a demo where... You can do this you, yourself, yeah. which is so cool. So you can take any ball that you have, and then you can set up little towers on it, hold a light so that you can measure the shadows, and then you'll be able to predict the size of the ball. So we're going to do this with this one here. That, that, that's right. So this this is going to be our uh, Earth, see? And we, we want to be able to find the circumference of our little Earth here, our little, little ball. And this is the biggest ball we had that was light in color. So that, that, that's why we, we chose this particular one. And then, yeah, l l later on, we're going to let that represent the sun. So, okay, so we get our... So we're going to use two nails, but you can use anything you want for your, your poles. See, these nails are kind of nice because they have a big head, so that'll help them to stand upright. But, yeah, it's, it should be doable with anything that you can get to stand straight up. Straight up from the, so, from the ball. So I'm, I'm just going to poke a hole in my tape here. And again, right there. Okay. And then we are going to put the tape on top of the, the ball. And now we just need to get a light source. So I want you to notice something. Those two nails are not parallel. Instead, they're, they're pointing straight out, so perpendicular to the surface of the ball, right where they meet. Or you could say they're pointing straight towards the center of the sphere. And that's Good going point. to happen anytime you have a, a sphere. Good um, point. So, so now we're going to set our ball right here. I'm going to pull out my uh, phone because it has a flashlight on, on it. And then we've got to turn off the, the lights so that we can make a marking for our shadow. Oops, turning off the lights. And it's going to get real dark uh -huh. for just a second. But here's Math Dad with his okay. light that he'll so, hold as high as he can above. So I, I have to hold my light. And I, I can't hold it down close because that will distort the shadows. I've got to hold it as high as I can. And then I just need to make sure that one shadow disappears entirely. Okay, so if I turn it like this. That one has no shadow. And now with a marker, I'm just going to trace this shadow to see how long it is. Okay. So keep it in that position. Just Got so. it. All right. So show them the marks. So we held it above so that this first nail had no shadow. And then that's the shadow we got for the second nail. 
And now if we measure those and put them into the Desmos, hem, um, brilliant Desmos thing that maybe I built, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to find out how big this this ball is, what the circumference of the ball is, and then we'll test it and see if we're right. All right, so we're, I'm, I'm going to open up. So in, in this activity here, you're not sharing your screen. I'm not so sharing they, my screen. Yeah, they can't see it. Also, you're saying if I talk to them and I just don't show them, that doesn't yeah. count. I, I hope you showed it to them before. Did yeah. you share the screen before? I don't know what I did. Uh, <laughs> Application window on the next tab. Application, Chrome tab? Yep. There we go, all right. Do, 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 do. Okay. Here is the, the activity I built. So we can drag this point along. And what we'll see is the shadow gets longer and longer the further we get away from the, the vertical pole. So that, that, that's what we're testing right now. We need to get out our measuring tape. And we're going, or I've got a ruler here. And we're going to actually measure the height of each nail and I mean, we, we can pick whatever units we want to measure. Okay, so the length, I'm, I'm gonna pick uh, centimeters. Maybe I should use millimeters. Okay, just eyeballing it. Okay, so I, I think that's about 15 millimeters okay. for the shadow length. Oh, for the shadow length. 15 millimeters for the shadow length. Okay. Okay. The distance between the nails appears to be about 65 millimeters. Okay, and now the height of the nail. Okay, the height of the nail. I'm gonna peel this off. Hoping we don't have an accident where I we accidentally pop our ball. Okay, so the height of the nail is right around 28. 28 millimeters. The circumference of our ball is approximately 830 units. Is that, does that sound right? 830, we're gonna find out. Sorry. 830 millimeters, that sounds a little too small to me. So 83 centimeters? 83 that, centimeters, we're gonna test it. Yeah, I don't know, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll see how, how accurately we measured. All right, moment of truth to see if this works. So here is our round measuring tape. All right. We actually tried this yesterday and got a slightly different number, if I remember it. Yeah, so here we should be about 104. I don't know, we got that perfectly around. Yeah, about 104 centimeters, which would have been about 1,000. So, so we're a little bit yeah, off. I'm not, I'm, I'm, now I want to go back and check our shadow, net, but I, I, I already <laughs> tore it off. But uh, yeah. I'm so a, the, the lesson here is the higher you can have the light, the better. And I think I think yesterday you were holding the light higher because we had it up on the table today. So yeah. the closer that your that your light source is to the ball, the more the more that will kind of shift your results from being accurate. But with the Earth, with how big the Earth is and how large the Sun is, um, the the results that Aristosthenes got were really accurate. He measured the circumference of the Earth within, I want to say like within a couple kilometers. Like it was really close. Oh, he was within a few hundred. Yeah. So, yeah. so very, very very close. It's considering, I mean, often when you're looking at a shadow, where does it stop? Where does it end? I mean, it's it's kind of blurry there, and just that little bit of difference as you're eyeballing it can make a huge difference in the overall outcome when you're talking about something as big as the entire earth. That's true. So if you want to, if you want to try that out, um, please do. And you can post on our Facebook page, let us know what your results were. I have to say yesterday's um, engineering challenge to make a compass, um, Thiakesh and Alexis both posted little videos on Facebook where they had fun, um, compasses that looked like they were rotating pretty well. Although it's, it's difficult to get a needle to be a really effective compass. And I think the lesson is if you're gonna go out exploring in the woods, make sure you have a GPS or a map. Don't just have a magnet in your pocket and think that you can make a compass <laughs> and find your way back. That's bad. I probably would not be wise. So what do we have next, math dad? All right, so up next. I mean, um, science dad. So, yeah, science dad, what are you <laughs> talking about? We have fact or fiction. All right, so fact or fiction, I made, yeah, I looked all these up in advance. 
Um, all right, so fact or fiction? There is ice on Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. Fact or fiction, there is ice on Mercury. I am saying true, and I'm seeing Jessica and um, a couple of the people in the chat saying true as well. There is ice on Mercury, but only in a couple locations. Mercury being so close to the sun is ridiculously hot, but it has some craters that actually never see sunlight. They're permanently shadowed. And because it has no atmosphere, those permanently shadowed, or very little atmosphere, those permanently shadowed craters are really cold, and there is ice. Wow. So Mercury is a planet of extremes, extreme temperatures. That, that, that is crazy. All right, fact or fiction. Mercury has a magnetic field, but Venus does not. Also true. Last I looked, there's really no explanation for this. It's a bit of a mystery to us why Mercury has a magnetic field, but Venus doesn't. I mean, the molten core of iron and nickel is what... And that's what causes, causes our Earth, magnetic yeah. field. But I, I think it might be that Mercury is so close to the sun that maybe there's some gravitational, I don't know, yeah. something happening. All right. Okay, fact or fiction. A day on Venus is longer than a year on Venus. True. True. Venus turns so slowly that it actually will circle the sun entirely before it makes one rotation. So if you're measuring by Earth days, how long it takes Venus to go around the sun versus how long it takes it to rotate and have one sunrise and sunset, a year is longer than a day on Venus. That is pretty crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Fact or fiction. Neutron stars have a solid surface, a half mile thick crust floating on a fluid of subatomic particles. So a piece of a neutron star the size of an apple seed weighs more than a freight train. Neutron stars are so bizarre. So I have to say, I saw so many people in the chat commenting and saying true on our other things. You guys were totally right. And I'm seeing a lot of people, Dan, Becky, and um, Gage, and Michelle. I'm seeing variety of answers this time, but mostly true. And this one is also true. All of our fact or fictions today were true. And this one it seems like there's no way it could possibly be true. Could you have a piece of matter the size of an apple seed that would weigh more than a freight train? You can. Neutron stars are so bizarre and they are so so dense. Remember, an atom is actually mostly empty space. You have the neutrons and the protons and the electrons orbiting around, but most of the space that makes up an atom is space. It's emptiness. And in a neutron star, it's like all that space has been eliminated and you just have packed matter super close together. Uh, that is crazy to think about. So that and it's mostly neutrons, right? That's why they, they call it a neutron yeah. star. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. <laughs> wow. All right. So that concludes our fact or fiction. Up next, Math Mom is going to give us a little math lesson. All right. So for my math lesson today, because I'm Math Mom, we are going to talk a little bit about angles. And I'm curious if anyone has a favorite angle. My favorite angle is a right angle. So a right angle is straight down and straight over 90 degrees. And the cool thing about angles is that if you take a straight line, a straight line is 180 degrees. And if you have an angle drawn, this plus this will always add up to 180. So science dad, yes. if we have a, well, you just made that's about a 45 degree angle I've got there. Sure. 45 degree angle here. What would we have over here? How would we find that out? Ooh, well, together they have to add up to be 180. So, yeah, we do 180 minus 45, we get a 135 degree angle. So, this one's 135, that one is 45, and they add up to 180. Now, we have some fun names for angles angles that are smaller than 90 degrees, narrower, we call acute angles. Not spelled like that, but oh no, is it spelled like that? Yeah. yeah. Acute. Yep, just one a word. Cute angle, but one <laughs> word. <laughs> and then angles that are larger than 90 degrees, we call obtuse. So a cute angle kind of reminds me of like a little alligator math. Cute little, cute little alligator getting ready to bite something. And then an obtuse angle is like it's um, kind of like a, a chair that you're gonna lounge back in. So chair that you wanna just kind of sit back in and take a break, that's an obtuse angle and then a little alligator that's getting ready to bite something. 
and is a cute, friendly alligator. That does not look very cute and friendly. That looks kind of scary. <laughs> um, that would be your acute angle. So that is my basic geometry lesson about angles. And in hour two, we will talk about triangles. So, so I've got some questions for you then. Yes. All right. So how would we figure out or approximately where would be a 60 degree angle be? So if we were just trying to eyeball an angle, what does that look like? That's a good question. So if we're trying to eyeball an angle, 180 degrees is a straight line. If we cut it in half, there's our 90 degree. So we'll do a dashed line for 90. But if we want to get a 60 degree angle, hmm, we can do thirds. So if we kind of go in thirds, right? So those were halves? So you, you, so, you cut everything in half again? Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I'm at a disadvantage here. OK, so if we sort of go in thirds. Does that look about, about like now we have three sections? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So. This would be 30 degrees. No. Nope. <clears throat> 60 degrees. Thank you, Math Dad. I mean, thank you, Science Dad. So we have 60 degrees, and then plus another 60 is 120, plus another 60 gives us 180. And if we cut this in half, then that's a 30 degree angle. That's right. So. <laughs> What we often, if, if I may, if I <laughs> yes, may be yes. so bold, so <laughs> we try to draw the angle itself here. And if, if we're being extra careful, we even put an arrowhead on it, although we, we don't always do that. So this is a 60 degree angle. Here was our 120 degree angle. And yeah, that, that makes that makes sense. So then what if we what if we wanted to maybe draw in, in, in quadrant one here? Like you said up top, so we would get a 90 degrees. No, too high. There we go. 90 yeah. degrees is up 90 here. degrees is up here, and zero degrees is over here. So is it, is it possible to maybe label some other ones just so we can get a feel for it? Oh, get a feel for different angles? Yeah, yeah. I want to have some intuition. OK, so intuition for angles. So if we split this completely in half, if we just go straight up in half, halfway between 90 and 0 is 45. So this is 45 degrees. And now that I know um, science dad's little mathy trick for writing this angle, I would say there's our 45 degree angle. And if we were going to do a 60 degree angle, I'd say that that would look about like this. So here's our 60 degree so angle. Does that look a little? Looks a little closer to 90 than 45, whereas 60 is closer to 45 than 90, right? Oh, whoops. 60 is closer to 45 so it's, than 90. It's one third of the way. It might be easier to go from outside in. Here, we'll try one more time. And then I will show you guys. There you go. There we go. There's a 60 degree angle. And then if we want to do a 30, I think that's a pretty good estimate for a 30 degree angle. So there's our 30 degree. There's our 60 degree. But drawing on a whiteboard can be a little bit tricky. And fortunately for everyone involved, including me, there is a really cool Desmos activity you can do to practice your angle knowledge. So we throw up that Desmos code again? Yes, so, yes. So Let me throw up the Desmos code real quick. So you can log on just by going to student, whoops, studentdesmos.com. And then if you enter in that code D6NVD9, then that will bring you in. And if you copied and pasted the Patreon, um, the code that was in Patreon, we've updated it. That one was different. And we'll take you to. Although that code will work too. It will work too, but it'll just take you to a different, a different one. So if we share our screen now and bring up our Desmos activity, you saw that you can enter um, to get the circumference of your sphere. But on the next activity, you can practice angles on the third activity, you can practice angles. So there are incoming asteroids and you get to set your shield booster to defend against it. So it says a 15 degree angle is coming. I'm gonna say, ooh, I think that is about right here and then try it. And I was pretty close. Yeah, so you, you blocked And the next one it. is eight degrees. And so I'm eight degrees is really small. I'm gonna come down here. Oh, that might be too low. Yep, I was just a little bit too low, but I was close. Yeah, the asteroid was still small. 
Now the next one is 64, and if I make it so it's not very close, if I say, ooh, I think 64 is here, really 64 is gonna be more over here, and try it, my asteroid uh. was huge, and I lost so many health points. Next is 58. I'll try one more guess with 58 and try and be a little more accurate. So more than 45, I think about right there is 58. And again, my asteroid was small and I didn't use very, lose very many health points because I was close. Now you're never gonna bounce the asteroid back. Even if you get exactly right, it will still go by, but I'll wow. miss a couple on purpose just for fun so you can see what happens if you lose all your, your health points. So there's another big asteroid that comes in. Oh, and you lost all your life. You only survived five asteroids. I survived five asteroids. So I bet that if you play this, you can get a lot more asteroids than that. So that's a fun Desmos activity that you can that you can enjoy. That's right. And yeah, it's not super important that you can get the angle spot on, but if you have good intuition for how big an angle is, you'll be able to uh, you use that in a lot of situations in life and yeah it's just good to have a good math sense number sense and uh, a sense for how, how ge geometry works yes you'll make your math sense strong with this exercise indeed indeed the math jedis all right so up next we have our engineering challenge and for our engineering challenge we actually want to see if we can make a model of the solar system and it turns out we can't we're we're, we're, we're pretty bad at this but um wh so, what we can do though is try to come up with the right scale and but it's, it's not going to be functioning we can't make this thing spin around i i have seen some cool models like coat hangers and they were, they were able to to mount everything we're going to do the best we can but uh don't get don't get your hopes too high it, it's, it's going to be fun and when you make your model if you can make them close to being to scale like make the planets that are larger bigger make the planets that are smaller smaller um, props, props for that, points for that, but you don't need to make it completely to scale, especially with how far things are spaced out. So if we, if we, that code where we, um, we just gave you to Desmos, if we go back to the second activity, you guys will see that you can, we built a little, um, a little activity a little calculator. where it will calculate your size of planet. So if we go back to activity two. On, on screen number two, we, we took our big yellow ball and calling it the sun. We entered just the size of our sun. So this was in uh, centimeters. The diameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the diameter. Yes, sir. The diameter of the sun there. And this calculator tells you the diameter of all the planets. Yeah. So if you want to have your earth be, let's say, a tennis ball, then you could enter in for the, you know, you can right. play with it, make it, make the size of the sun bigger and smaller until your earth size gets to be about where the calculator says your, your tennis ball is, you know, let's say like four inches, whatever units you're using. And then you can scale the rest of them from there. That's right. So we get the diameter. So I, I, I used, so the diameter would be in centimeters and we can also get the distance from the sun there. So we'll come back to that question yep. in, as we get going. And I just realized, I think when we were sharing our screen, we had like a small box there. My apologies, everybody. It was supposed to be big. Next, oh. time, we next, time, next time we share it, it will be big so you can see it better. All right. Okay, time to engineer. All right, so this guy is no longer the Earth. He is now the sun. And we have the question, how big should the planets be? So in, in the chat, are planets bigger than the sun or smaller than the sun? What, what do you guys think? Planets, they are totally right. Planets are way smaller than the sun. The sun is huge. Let's try this giant ball of gas that's burning and burning billions of miles away. Yes. Say. So if we have this set to be our sun, that means that our planets are going to be pretty tiny. That's right. So, so how tiny? Like, are we talking maybe a basketball size? Well, Mercury talking is, about a baseball size, maybe a, maybe a golf ball or a ping pong ball. Mercury hmm. is going to be almost too small to see. So uh, that's I, right. So so that in that little calculator that you can see in that activity, you get the sizes of each of the planets in, so, in centi the diameter in centimeters, and the the numbers that are there to start with were actually the numbers for this particular ball, and. Uh, yeah, they're going to be pretty small. 
So this is like 10 times larger than Mercury is going to be. And it's so tiny, I bet you can't even see it on screen. We're looking at 0. 0.6 millimeters for Mercury. Okay, so if you think about a ballpoint pen, the, the tip of that is probably about the right size, maybe even a little too big for Mercury. So yeah, we, we, we wanted to pick our sun to be big enough that we could actually even see our planets. But you know what? I'm holding up a little piece of clay and you can't even see it. Oops. So. I'm gonna right here. This little ball in my hand, we're saying is maybe eight to ten times bigger than the actual planet Mercury would be in our in our model. Yes, if the sun happens to match up with our big ball here. All right. So now you, you make Venus, and I'll make Earth. So now we're okay. gonna go through and make our planets out of these little balls of clay. Yeah, so Mercury was just zero point six millimeters, so barely half a millimeter. So Venus, it turns out, ooh, I like, I like my colors here. I've got yellow and red. That's 1.5 millimeters in diameter. Well, 1.5 milli millimeters is still smaller than the ball that I'd, I'd showed you before. So <laughs> this is gonna be microscopic in, in size. Man, I don't know if I can make it small enough. So we've got Mercury, Earth, Mars. Oh, that's so we're gonna just we're gonna have them on top of the ruler, and then we'll bring it close so you guys can see our inner planets when we finish. All right, there you go. All right. So if now you will you hold up our sun again? So if this was the size of the sun, here are our inner planets. We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and that's about how small they would be if the sun is this size. Uh, and I, I would say they're actually a little well, too they, big there, but that's about as they're, small as we can. <laughs> that's about as small as I can get them and still stick them on the ruler. Yeah. Now, those are the four inner planets, but then we get to the gas giants. Now, the gas giants are bigger, right? They, they should be big like a basketball or, or a baseball, right? They're going to be... No. They're going to be bigger. They're, they're, they are bigger, bigger, and they're gas giants, but they're not anywhere nearly as big as the sun. So I've got Jupiter is 17.2 millimeters, so 1.7 centimeters. So that's quite a bit bigger. Which one are you working on? I'm, gonna, I'm doing Jupiter. Oh, you're doing Jupiter. Yep, you do oh. Saturn. All right, Saturn, as we all know, is green. No, um, but today it is. So I'm gonna make my, my Jupiter and then measure it to see how close I am to 1 point, no, yeah, 1 1.7. 1.7 centimeters? So oh, okay. That's actually pretty good right there. That's not bad. That'd be just oh. a little bit bigger, I think. Yeah, well, we managed to estimate mine as well. So we're getting these balls that are indeed bigger, but not big by any sense of the imagination. So I'm curious, science dad, what's the best prank that you ever played on April Fools or ever had someone play on you? Or prank? Oh, it's not pranks. Th 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 that's a good question. Do, have I been a part of any good pranks? I, I had this uh, co-worker once who uh, we, we, we tricked into thinking some girl was stalking him. So we, we would leave letters in his mailbox from this, this girl who's, oh, I, I'm so in love with you. I know we're meant to be together forever. That's, that's not and, a very nice prank. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And we thought, ah, oh, they must have seen past it. They, because they never said anything, but then one night they, they called us up and they were talking to us, and they're like, "Oh, you'll never believe what happened. That this this girl that I met that we that we had pre pretended to be, but he didn't know about, but we, she followed me home. And so every, it turned out every day when they would leave their apartment, they were looking around, tr trying totally. to say, there's, "Where is she? Is she following us?" There's Jupiter. So they, they, they were totally paranoid. Th th thinking that, that they were being followed. So, all right, I've got way better pranks that I've done. I'm ready to hear about All right, all right let's, let's hear your pranks. All right, so one time we, um, our neighbors in college on April, kind of around April Fool's, we got this little prank war going back and forth. So we gathered recycled, like old newspapers from so many people. Like we, it, took us a, it took us a while to store up this many newspapers. And once we got a whole bunch of newspapers, 
We took all the newspapers, crumpled them like each page into a ball, and we filled their entire um, apartment mostly with newspaper. And so when they came home, <laughs> they opened the door and it was just nothing but newspaper in like the whole entire apartment. It was pretty funny. <laughs> took me quite a while to get it out. That's and then they um, broke into our apartment and they took all the labels off of the, the canned goods in our cupboards. So then for the next month, it would it was like mystery dinner. Every time you opened a can, you didn't know what it was going to be. And you'd open it up and be like, all right, I guess we're having chili with baked beans. Or, you know, there would just be random stuff like chili with peaches. I mean, you never know. You never know until you open the can. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> all right, so we've got, got Saturn here. Okay. And then uh, I've got and me a, it's going to be ne Neptune. Neptune. Uranus. Uranus. So Uranus is a planet that no matter how you pronounce, pronounce it, there's potential for potty humor jokes. So we had to just say that and get it out of the way. So most people say it Uranus, um, but astronomers pronounce it Uranus. So like urine and then us, Uranus, Uranus, you can say it either way, but Uranus oh. is the preferred pronunciation. Okay, um, now, here we go. Let's hold it up. It's supposed to be slightly smaller than yours. All right. Close enough. All right, close enough. So with with more time, we would definitely want to, you know, maybe suspend these from some little strings and hold them next to the sun. And now we've got to, let's get it in order. Come over here so that your sun is on the other side. All right. So here is our model of the solar system that is somewhat to scale in terms of size. So notice that the sun is just enormous, so big. And then we have Mercury. Mercury. Venus, Venus, Earth, Mars, Mars Jupiter, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And those are our eight planets. We have four gas giants or bigger gaseous planets in the outer solar system. And then we have our four rocky planets in the inner solar system. And in between the two, there is an asteroid belt. Pretty awesome, right? In indeed. Now, okay, so that makes me want to think, since we were trying to get things to scale, at least somewhat, trying to be somewhat accurate, um, are these the right distances apart from each other? Not at all, not at all. No. And if you look on that Desmos activity, and this time we'll share the screen and actually have it be big instead of you seeing it super tiny. We can do it, we can do it. We totally can do it. Share. So screen number two here. We have the, the distances from the sun and the, the numbers that are there to start with yeah. are exactly the, the right numbers. So Mercury is 14 meters from the sun. Yeah, you, can, you can't change that. All right. So 14 meters from the sun, that is... So how, how big is 14 meters? Well, that's probably the whole length of your house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you did want to build a to scale solar system with size and distance, you would need to go to like a large, you need more than a football field. To, to get everything to fit in with the sizes that we've cho chosen here. Absolutely, so and then Venus is going to be 26, 27 meters away. Um, Earth, 36 meters, Mars, 56 meters. Wait, but we're in we're in centimeters, right? Uh, the, the distances, I, we're in, oh, in actual meters here. Okay, so that's a little little tip here. Distances in meters and... Yeah. Yep. But okay, so, so I mean, Mars, is, uh, that's gonna fit inside a football field, but then you're gonna hit the asteroid belt and Jupiter, then you're more than two football fields at that point. To get to Saturn, you're almost twice as far as that. And then each time you're getting almost twice as far away. But yeah, but by the time we got to, to Neptune, we would be 1.1 uh, kilometers. Like, that's how big we would have to do this. So if you combine the what we've done today, where we had this big sun, but very small planets, and then you think about those are spread out across so an entire far. kilometer. And I mean, these inner planets are not that far away, maybe within, a, maybe your neighbor's house or just slightly down the street, depending on where you live. But then to walk to Jupiter, but you've got to go way far. Yeah, you've got okay. several football fields here. And by the end, by the time you get to Neptune, you've had to go over a kilometer. So that lets you see how much empty space there actually is between the, the planets of the solar system. And of course, these are things that are close to the sun. Space is much more vast than just our solar system. I got to share really fast. Um, <laughs> one of the people in the chat said that they got pranked this morning um, because their their mom came in yelling fire, fire, 
when they were in the shower. <laughs> and then they, they had to like run outside, just wrapped in a towel and thought the house was really on fire, but it wasn't. That's not a very nice April Fool's <laughs> prank, but yeah. it made me laugh. That's right. Yeah. All right, Science Dad, what do we have next? All right, up next we have a special guest who's going to give us an art lesson. <laughs> and so I will say, you guys probably remember those of you who who watch regularly. We had a little contest to see who could who who could sell more T-shirts. And then the person who lost that contest is going to do a Bob Ross inspired art lesson. But while I'm getting ready for the art lesson. Because, um, yeah, props to that song for <laughs> for winning the t-shirt contest. Um, Math Dad is going to share um, more of our art so that I have time to get ready. Because we had such fantastic drawings of the, the states come in. So take it away. Oops, and I just called you the wrong name again. Take it away, Science Dad. That's right. I'm, I'm Science Dad. I don't know where you get that other name from. All right. <clears throat> so Oregon. We were traveling to Oregon as a kid, and oh yeah, lots of lots of fun things to tell us about Oregon. I like it. Oh, more Oregon. I remember all the green trees. That's one of the things I remember from, from being there. It was just so much greener than where I lived. Oh, we're up into Canada. There's Ontario. And Alberta. Aha. Alberta, well done. Aaron and I ah, can't. It's a little fuzzy with picture. Back to Pennsylvania, some rich history there. Very nice. Texas, the Lone Star State. The blue bonnet, that must be the Texas state flower. Yeah. Good job, Anara. I don't know if I would know what a blue bonnet was. But... They're kind of like Lupin. Okay, Oklahoma. Awesome. Oh, they've got the song. Oklahoma, uh, I think, has one of the very best state songs. Oh, absolutely. In Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. It's a fantastic song. And you got my song in there with it. I mean, th there are two great songs that <laughs> deserve to go together. So. I, I don't know about that. Good. <laughs> All right, Natalie, we've got Massachusetts. Nicely done. Is, is Massachusetts always so, so colorful? I've just been... Italy. Uh, I don't know if there's something going on. There. Yes. All right. So shout out to our, our viewers in Italy. Representing Europe, Caleb. He's got Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> and you're singing your song, and I'm saying, stop it now. I love it. Got your angry eyebrows. I love it. Back to Kansas, yes. And I love the collection of things they drew that reminded them of home. So some outdoor things in their house and sunsets, very nice. Wisconsin, Wisconsin with back. cheese and Virginia. Good job, Connor and Allen, yes. Maryland, famous for crabs and Old Bay, love that. Crazy border, good job. Good job, Annabelle. Annabelle. Ohio, ooh, here's a riddle. I have a moth but can't tack. I have feet but can't walk, I'm small. Not tall, you can hold me and pet me. What am I? Moth, you can't talk. Ooh, but... I'm gonna bookmark that. I think we should have that be one of our what's in the bag. So stop looking, science dad. <sighs> I gotta figure it out. Uh, <laughs> Come back to it. New right. Mexico. UG, yeah. Do you know that New Mexico, the continental divide goes through New Mexico at a surprisingly high elevation? So so the, when you, you say when you say continental divide. Is, is, are you talking about like where the water Yes, so splits? there's all through the states in the west, you have water rainfalls and it will either travel down to the Mississippi or it will travel down to the west coast. And that's the continental divide. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got Virginia the there. Mother of presidents, very nice. Eight presidents, that's impressive. All right, Andrew, got Maryland there. Maryland. Washington State, a beautiful drawing of the birds. Yeah, that, that's I something it. I know about Washington is they get a lot of rain. In right. Iowa, with the, it looks like maybe a tractor there. Iowa is famous for lots of corn, too. Indiana, nicely done. And Tennessee, I love it. Good job, Zane. Kansas, good job, Mark. <laughs> Oregon, I thought these two drawings of Oregon were beautiful. And they've got Mount Hood there, lots of trees. It's very green. The grandma's house. South Carolina with the four Ooh, seasons. I like that one. All divided. Good job, Hayden. Very nice. And Nate, Utah, and the skiing. Got to love the skiing. He said he's missing that the ski resorts are all closed right now, and that is unfortunate <sighs> timing. Ontario, go Canada. Very nice. Then we've got Oklahoma. We have bison and oil. <laughs> <laughs> Washington, very nice. Chuck Taylor. Nebraska with the Huskers. Not going to sing a song or sting. I love it. <laughs> And then these are some cool facts about Alaska. Alaska is the biggest state by far. Um, it can be up to 95 degrees in the summer and negative 45 below in the winter. That's extreme Ooh. temperatures. 
And it's the most northwest and east state because it actually, if you follow the Aleutian Isles out, like follow those islands out, it actually breaks the east-west border. Oh, so is, it's, it, is, that, is that the International Dateline? Yeah, I believe so. Isn't that cool? I, which I did not know that, that's for sure. Yeah. Know, Alaska is full of surprises. New York and Missouri. Great job, you guys. Massachusetts. <laughs> Iowa. Jamie. Nicely done. Jamie. Love the corn and the eagle. Michigan <laughs> and Maryland. It hadn't occurred to me how hard of a state Michigan would be to draw, but with the upper and lower portions there. Well, and, and of course, Maryland's crazy hard. Yeah, yeah. But as usual, I am way impressed with the artwork. Oh, the artwork is um, awesome. If you can tell what something is, you know, it's pretty good artwork, but th th these are really easy to tell. A lot. We've got Alberta and Ontario. Go Canada. Land of Lincoln. <laughs> Now this, when I saw it, I thought that looks like Illinois, but I'm not sure is Illinois the land of Lincoln. So I typed, so I typed is Illinois, and autocomplete said a state, and I just thought, oh no, do people really Google is Illinois a state? Well, thank you to okay. Rishab. Now really? you know Illinois is both the a state and the land of Lincoln. In Delaware, that's the first Delaware. We've seen. Yeah, and the first first state in the first cities in the in the United States. Awesome, Wisconsin. And Michigan, look, you can draw Michigan by using your hands. Isn't that fantastic? Ah, very nice, Malika. So, yeah, put the one hand there to show the upper peninsula and then other hand to show the lower. I thought that was great. I like it, Kate. Oh, and then we've got Alaska again. Skyler. And Florida, nicely done with Disneyland, the Daytona 500. Well done, Jana. And corn in Iowa. The tallest corn I've ever seen was in Iowa. Well done, Inara. And Ontario. We'll pause there because now... We have a special guest with crazy hair. Now, I have to tell you, if you have never seen Bob Ross, you should definitely check out some Bob Ross painting tutorials. I used to watch these when I was a kid sometimes, and he does a fantastic job of teaching you how to paint landscapes. And he also has wonderful large hair kind of out in a perm and, and just a, a really nice demeanor. So I'm gonna do my very best to give you a Bob Ross inspired painting lesson, but we are not going to paint a landscape on Earth. We are going to paint a landscape on one of Jupiter's moons called Io. So if you would like to paint along with me, I am using um, paints that I got at the, the pharmacy, a little paint set, and the oranges, the yellows, and the reds are gonna be especially important, but we'll also be using black. So here is my paper, my canvas, and we're gonna start off with a backdrop because it's always easiest in painting to start with the background and then move forward. And I should say right off the bat, I am not, um, I'm not a professional artist. <laughs> so we'll just do the best we can with what we've got. Science Mom Liza is a really good artist. So shout out to Science Mom Liza because this is her easel that I borrowed. All right, we're gonna start off with our background and we're gonna just give kind of a nice dark gray. I'm gonna add a little bit more water to my paint to make sure that it is nice and runny and not too dark. Io does not have any atmosphere, not very much atmosphere. It has just a little bit of an atmosphere. And so the sky is mostly gonna look black, just like when you are like up in the space station, the sky would look black because you're just staring out into space. So we're sort of painting in our backdrop here. And I can tell that Science Dad has some commentary. He's looking at me like, hmm. This is all gonna be black? Just, just, just curious. This top part here is gonna be black, but we're gonna leave a little space here for our sun. And then we're leaving space here for Jupiter because Io is one of the moons that orbits Jupiter. And now I'm trying to just sort of trace a mountain line here, so here's my, Jupiter's gonna go here, and then my line of mountains is gonna go here, and then I'm gonna try and, as quickly as I can, fill in the rest. I'm gonna get a little more black here, and a little more water. I'm gonna move my water up here so I can, here's my little water container. Did you, do you know how many moons Jupiter actually has? I think it has 20. That would be a great thing for someone to fact check. Uh -huh. In the in the chat, do you know science? I, I, I do know. I, I actually looked this up. So I remember when, when I was a kid, going through science classes, it, it was somewhere in the teens, actually. 
but uh, it's higher than that because uh, they keep discovering new moons. Ooh. So you can this this planet is so far away that um, Jupiter can't actually be seen with the naked eye, but uh, the moons of Jupiter can't. So you've got to get a telescope. But then, of course, they are pretty dark. You're not going to be able to see much, and not all of them are as big as Io. I, I was one of the, the bigger moons in the solar system. So because of that, we th th they're discovering new moons every year. In fact, when, when I looked it up, it said that they had discovered 19 new moons of Jupiter just this last year. Oh, that, was, wow. oh, actually, that one might have been Saturn. But yeah, they, they're discovering new moons. So uh, 79 moons. 79 moons? That is way higher than I would have guessed. I love it. Now, there's always the chance that when I looked this up, it was on a site that was pulling an April Fool's joke on me. So, so maybe we should ask people in the comments to see if they can, can verify that crazy stat. But uh, 79 moons. That is amazing. All right. There is my sky. And it does look a little bit splotchy, but that is totally okay. I am happy with it. And now we are going to paint Jupiter. And I'm going to get some orange and bring it here into the middle and make it mix it in with my watery paint to be a little bit darker. And then I'm going to grab some yellow and mix it in. And we're going to, oh, now it's looking kind of brown. I'll add a little more orange because Jupiter is mostly oranges and yellows. It's a gas giant. And we'll kind of do like a little stripey stripe action here. Happy little planet. <laughs> And a little more yellow here for the other section. Some yellowish, yellowish stripes. And it would be kind of fun if we added in our nice red dot there as well. And now just to make our border of Jupiter a little bit more defined, I'll curve like that. And there is Jupiter in the sky <laughs> of, our, of our sand landscape. And now we're ready to start doing Io itself. Io is one of the most volcanic planet, not uh, planet's not the right word. What, what's the word I'm looking for? Science Celestial dead? body. I don't... Objects. It's the most volcanic thing in the solar system. There are more volcanic eruptions on Io than there are anywhere else in the solar system. And its volcanoes spew sulfur dioxide. So the first thing that we're going to draw back here is our skyline of volcanic mountain. So I'm going to get kind of a dark brown and I'm going to draw this horizon here of dark volcanic mountains on Io. Get a little more paint. So if it's volcanic, that means it's got a hot interior, right? It does. It has a molten core and it is spewing lava and sulfur dioxide all the time. So we have a rock here on Io. And some of, the, some of those rocks are going to be kind of a dark brown. And I'll sort of put in some dark brown here on the sides of our, our mountains. And then depending on how much sulfur there is versus um, other material, like, um, like the silica. So most of the rock that we have is high in silica. That's a type of, um, or quartz is made of silica as well. And so depending on how much silica you have versus sulfur, there, you get different colors on Io. So these mountains here, I'm gonna color kind of brown, but we also have reds and yellows because of the sulfur. And back here in the distance, I'm going to make a little volcanic plume. So I'm gonna get a little bit of blue, sort of blue on that, hopefully it's dry. And then we're gonna take our brush and we're just going to go sort of like up the top, and then we're gonna go whoosh, whoosh, to show all of that coming down. And the reason that I did blue is because some of these eruptions are so high and the sulfur particles get spread out so far that from space, they do look kind of bluish, but that's sort of hard to see. And I decided after I painted it, I wanna be able to see that a little better. So we're gonna take some yellow and just sort of add in a little bit of yellow to highlight that a little bit more. There's our volcanic eruption. Yellow and blue make green. They do make green. Next, we are going to come down and fill in this foreground more. And so I'm going to take a little bit of red and mix it into my, 
my paint here and we're gonna fill in our, our, our hills here. So we have some red. Next, we'll add a little bit more orange. And if you look at pictures of space from space of Io, you will see orange and red and all sorts of colors on the surface of Io. It's really a colorful, incredible planet. And if there was life on Io, it wouldn't look anything like the life we have on Earth. But I imagined what I thought life might be like. And that's what we're gonna draw in the front here. So we'll get another little streak of brown, like maybe here's an older lava flow. And we'll put a little bit of red for maybe a little bit of a lava, a recent lava flow that's leaking out. And then we're gonna do a whole bunch of yellow up here in the front where it's an older area that's kind of frosted over. The cool thing, one of the coolest things about Io, I think, is that it has a bit of an atmosphere during the day. There's gas on this planet, but then at night, when it goes behind Jupiter and it's shadowed from the sun, it gets so cold that all of that gas freezes into a solid. And then when it comes out again, the gas will go, will sublimate and turn back into a gas. And so it has an atmosphere that's sort of like disappearing and appearing, coming and going. And so for our life form on Io, I decided that a cool life form to live on Io would be rock coral. So here's our rock coral. Are we how, how, how big is the sun going to be? Or is, is there? Oh, let's do the sun before we forget about it. So our sun, we'll take just pure yellow and put it right up here. Our sun is going to look a bit more star-like, um, but will still be visible in the sky. But yeah, it's far enough away. It's going to look more, more star-like. All right, so now we have our rock coral. So this imaginary plant that I'm making up looks kind of like a bumpy rock, but when it's daytime and that sulfur dioxide atmosphere sublimates into existence from being frozen on the ground, then this coral comes to life and it sends out these tiny little filaments to gather sulfur dioxide. And we actually do know on Earth, down in the deep part of the ocean, there are animals that live just by breaking down sulfur. There are these bacteria that can break down sulfur. And then this whole ecosystem built on those bacteria that live by the hot vents down in the ocean. So this, this animal would be somewhat similar to that. And just for fun, I'm going to say that the little tentacles that it puts out to gather sulfur dioxide are going to be purple. So put some little purple tentacles here coming out to gather sulfur dioxide. And then at nighttime, it would withdraw those tentacles in and they would be locked behind its rocky silica exterior, protected from the freezing cold vacuum that it experiences when all of that atmosphere turns to ice. So there is our rock coral, imaginary animal. Very nice. I'm sure NASA will be coming by to, to ask you more details. That's right. And if you drew along with me or if you make your own drawing, feel free to, to share it. We would love to see your artwork. You can tag us on social media or email it to us. And I'm going to just put a little water here to sort of fill in so that our rock coral looks a little more filled in and substantial, trying not to disturb my little purple branches that are out there to gather sulfur dioxide for energy. And there we have our landscape. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> now, I know what you really want to see is Math Dad do a painting lesson, but he, he, um, he yeah, was like, but uh, the, no. Zero people in the chat requested that. That's, that's right. Um, because you all know he would look fantastic in that goofy gray wig that you see on the thumbnail. So yeah. if you ever want us to do another Wacky Wednesday at a math lesson, let us know in the chat. Maybe I can convince him to... Oh, yeah. and I called you math dad again. Yeah, science I don't know dad. who you're talking about. Yeah. Maybe I can convince science, convince science dad. Science <laughs> dad. Is, that, that, that's right. All right. And I, I don't know if you kids caught on to it. Bob Ross is, is a famous artist who, who would, would do shows and he would get on he would just talk he was the nicest guy and the most encouraging and he would just draw these elaborate 
both beautiful landscape pictures of, of nature and it was just therapeutic almost just to watch like wow how, how does he do that and yeah you know, maybe i should have been drawing along as, as he went instead of just just watching but yeah so, a great we talked at the beginning about developing new skills and if you want to develop new skills there are a lot of bob ross um, videos online that's a great great way to practice painting that's right all right okay what's up next we want to talk Dad? we want to talk about science a bit more I, I, i'm gonna have uh math mom go over to the whiteboard i think i'm gonna have her draw some stuff as i talk because uh, she's a pretty good artist there um I, I do have that that desmos code up there again in, in case you were, were interested so d6 n b d9 so we're gonna we're gonna erase that in just a moment but just for, for anyone who didn't get the chance to, to see it earlier and, and wants to uh, but now is your, your chance to write that code down. So we and, be, oh, and we will be doing a, a, a third art showcase at the end because we we have more states states to show. Yeah. And all right. So we we went through our our whole solar system. We named eight planets. So when I was a kid, they said there were nine planets. So the question is, did one of the planets explode or disappear? Well, no, no, it did not disappear. What, what planet was that, Math Mom? Pluto. Pluto. So it was classified as a planet, but they, it no longer is. So why would that be? Why would they say it was a planet at one point and not a planet now? Well, it has to do with the fact that we've, we've learned more. It turns out there, there are lots of objects out there in space that are rotating around, but uh, the eight planets actually all rotate in the same plane as each other so you and want me to draw the solar system pluto didn't no i'm i'm, oh. I'm, I'm gonna have you make a venn diagram since Ooh. mathematicians are so good at venn diagrams i, I want to name some space terms and we're gonna see if science uh, math mom can get the right venn diagram here so okay so uh, maybe we should actually write these terms down or let me just tell you what they are be before, okay. before we get going too far all right so we got so planets We've got galaxy. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the universe. We've got a solar system. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and let, let, let's add a couple more down below. Maybe, maybe these ones won't fit quite as well, but I want to do comet, asteroid. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to throw the word satellite in there. Oh, I mean, maybe we should just do. Is that how you spell satellite? I think two weird. L's. Two L's. That, that, that's definitely. All right. And we could, we, let's throw moon in there as well. Okay. Okay. So then the question is which one belongs inside of another one? So m m maybe not all these will, will work for this Venn diagram, but let's see what we can come up with. With okay. a Venn diagram. So my my Venn diagram, the first thing I'm going to draw really big is the universe. Ah, that, that, that's clever. So the universe is going to be our, our biggest set. Our biggest, our biggest set. And inside the universe, we have galaxies. That, that is correct. So galaxies are clusters of, of stars that are maybe orbiting around each other to, together the, a much bigger interplay than we could possibly appreciate so we live in the milky way galaxy but yeah the universe is made up of many galaxies yeah so we would have tons and tons of these circles with galaxies but our galaxy is the milky milky way galaxy very, very good okay so what's and then the next one? inside this milky way galaxy we have our solar system Okay, that's that is correct. So the solar system is referring to all the the planets and things that are rotating around the sun. So the it's sun. it's yep. it's the, a star system or a sun system when you see the word solar system. So that so okay. everything going around one object is our solar system, and then the other ones are going to be interesting to add in. So comet. Uh, how about planets first? Planets first. Okay, so planets. Planets are inside the solar system. So we have another circle here, planets. 
Okay. Yep. All right. So now we we have comets, asteroid. I wrote satellites and moon. Ooh boy. Okay. I'm not entirely sure what the best way is to draw these. I would say comets can definitely travel like out of the solar system, out of our galaxy, maybe into another galaxy. So I'm going to use blue to try and make this a little bit more clear. Uh -huh. And we're going to say comet. Comets can travel really far distances. They're not orbiting around. Um, you, some of them will orbit around an object like a sun. So we we could have a comet that could be orbiting around the sun in a very huge loop. But and, most, and, of well, and are, most that we would ever see or encounter are indeed going around the sun. Although there, there could be plenty out there in the vacuum of space far away that, that could have larger, yeah. larger paths. Okay. Okay, an asteroid. And here, my my knowledge is sort of getting limited. Ooh, so, so, so let's see, what's, what is the difference between a comet and an asteroid? So that, that's a, a I think a comet. comets are built more of ice and asteroids are more rocky. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that, that's absolutely correct. So the asteroids were formed more by maybe collisions between, between the planets. And so you got this rock breaking off. And then the, actually the Jupiter as being such a big gas giant kind of pulls them together and they, they form that asteroid belt? Jupiter's like the um, the vacuum cleaner of our solar system. Because when you have <laughs> other things coming in, it has such a big gravity well that they'll tend to hit it and fall into it. So Jupiter, having a gas giant in our solar system actually is a huge thing for Earth. It protects us from getting hit with asteroids because a lot of them will go to Jupiter instead. That's right. And, and comets, though, are, just like you said, largely comprised of gas. <laughs> and o o over time, I said gas, uh, of ice, ice. Yep. But, but over time, some that ice breaks off, it becomes a tail. So yeah, comets often have a tail, but so that they don't hang out in the asteroid belt that they might be floating around ever, elsewhere. So they're caused by different things. Okay, so. So asteroids, I would say we have an asteroid belt in our solar system. So there are plenty of asteroids in here, but you can also have asteroids in other galaxies outside the solar system. You can have sort of free range asteroids like comets that are on a trajectory to who knows where. Okay. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to actually sit down with an astronomer and, and fact check the, those a little bit, but I, I think we are correct in what we've said. All right. What about moons? Moons orbit a planet. Uh, okay. So I think we could probably just stick moons in here because moons are always going to be around a planet. They're also going around a solar system, but they orbit the planet that's first. That's right. So it's, moons have to be attached to a planet. So I think that's a, a fair association there. All right, well, what about the word satellite? So that, that's an interesting word. And this, this word used to confuse me a lot because when we talk about... I can't spell satellite. All spellings of satellite look weird to me right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, you're definitely wrong. But, yep. uh, but okay. <laughs> so what, what is a satellite? So a satellite is, just, is something that's in orbit. So we could refer to the moon as a satellite or Often, when you're thinking about satellites, you're thinking about the man-made things that we've we've sent up that are orbiting, broadcasting signals, like for the cell phone reception or TV, radio. Um, yeah, so the, those are satellites. So satellites yeah. is a term that refers to something that's in orbit. So, uh, I mean, so satellites do have to be attached to something orbiting, but I mean, it's possible that the moon can have satellites going around it, or that a uh, planet can have satellites. And in some sense, the planets are satellites around the, the sun. We just had a fantastic question come in. Can I erase this? Yes, go, go ahead. Thing? So yeah, cool, cool Venn diagram. Thanks, science dad. Um, so we just had a great question come in saying, is the sun moving too, or do just the planets move around the sun? And here is something really cool. Our sun is actually orbiting larger objects in our Milky Way galaxy or in, that, are, that are heavier. And so you have the sun orbiting larger objects, and then you have our planet orbiting the sun, and then the moon orbiting our earth, and all of space, you have these really interesting things of like circles within circles within circles in terms of how things move in orbit. So yeah, the sun is moving too, and the sun does orbit a point in our Milky Way galaxy. Well, well done, Math Mom. So we will have time for some questions. But we're going to move on now to what's in the bag. Ooh. All right. So I'm going to, going to turn. I, I like I like this blue background better. It's, it's prettier. So we 
to, to turn around here. All right, so for our what's in the bag today. Um, he, he hasn't even read it yet. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of course I've, I've read it. What's in the bag? All right. Are you ready for this? It comes once in a minute, but never in a thousand years. It comes twice in a moment, but never in a decade. That's a great mm. question. What do you think, Science Dad? What is in the bag? I know the answer. It's 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 for you to figure this out. Roberta has it. It's the letter M. The letter M. Okay, so twice. Okay, sorry. Once in a minute, once but in never a minute. in a thousand years. Twice in a moment. Because the word moment has two, two M's. M's. Ah. But never in a decade. The letter M. The letter M. Very nice. And I'm seeing now lots of other people right after Roberta were putting yeah, in the yeah. right answer. Good job, you guys. Yeah, you guys are fast. Awesome. <laughs> I see a question there from Megan. It says, is a shooting star an asteroid or a comet? Is a shooting star an asteroid or a comet? That's a great question. Um, shooting stars that we see that go across the sky really quick, those are almost all meteors. So they're they're like, you can think of them as being tiny little asteroids. And I'm not exactly sure what the difference is between a meteor or an asteroid. I think it's a matter of size because they're both rocky objects traveling through space. That, that, that's a good, but, and, and once it enters Earth orbit, then it becomes a meteorite, or once it's, it's come in not orbit, uh, I think a meteor, the atmosphere. A meteorite, I think, actually makes contact with the ground, whereas a meteor um, just disintegrates. Mm. I believe that's the distinction, although that would be a good thing to fact check and look up because Neither, neither of us are astronomers. <laughs> All right. So what's in the bag? And next we have more math stuff. More math. All right. More math with Math Mom. So we are going to talk a little bit about triangles. But before we do, I want to share with you that we have a little puzzle. So each day we do a math puzzle. And I'll give you the answer to last month's math puzzle in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce yesterday's math. Yesterday's. Puzzle. What did I say? Last month's math. Last puzzle. month. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yesterday. <laughs> it was last month, though. You're right. It's true. M March, and now we're in April. That's true. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> so we're going to share my screen really quick to show you that there is a really cool math puzzle that we have for you today, and there's a handout that you can do. We're going to leave Ontario and go to this little math puzzle here. So you can see that all of those pieces of the triangle fit into that triangle, which is exactly five squares high. And I believe, is it 10 squares long? 13. 13 squares long. Okay, okay, let, let, let's look at that. I, four pieces, and all four pieces are identical? Yes, we'll go back and do it again. So we have the blue triangle, the green triangle, the red one, and the orange one. And if we just move the green, the triangles, have them switch places, we end up with a blank square. So the question is, how is this possible? This is our math mystery for today. And there is a handout that you can use to try it out yourself. So don't just take my word for it because I could have done something crazy with the screen. You can print out this little handout. It's on the Patreon page, free download, just print it out and then you can try it yourself. Here's the big triangle. You can cut these pieces out and then see if you can rearrange them so that you go from here to here rearrange them on the grid and see if you can figure out what is going on. How can you take the same pieces, put together a triangle that is the same size, but have a blank square? How is that possible? Whoa, this is the perfect puzzle for April Fool's Day. It is, it is. So this is kind of a fun one to give to somebody. You can be like, all right, I've got something for you. And they'll think there's like some April Fool's trick and then they'll try it and they'll be like, wait, what, how does it work? So that is our math puzzle for today. And now the answer to yesterday's math puzzle. Let's come over here. That's right. So the puzzle last time was how many one digit numbers, how many two digit numbers are there, and how many 10 digit numbers are there? Like how, how do we figure that out? Yeah, so let's 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 do the first couple to just remind ourselves. So one digit numbers, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we get to 10. So that's a two digit number. Positive numbers? Positive numbers. Yep, just positive numbers. So there are nine one-digit numbers. And now two-digit numbers. We start at 10, and then we go all the way to 99. Hmm. 90. We have 90. And then three-digit numbers. Did anyone figure out how many three-digit numbers there were? I'll look in the chat real fast. 
So three digit numbers, we would start at 100 and then go all the way to 999. We're starting to see a pattern. Mm. And here's the cool thing about math. When we use math, we don't just solve it for this one case. We can solve it for all questions if we come up with the right equation. So we need to know if this is n. So one digit or two digits or three digits. We want to know for n digits, for any number. So for n digits, you can tell that there's a pattern here with 9, 90, 900. Hmm, each time we increase this by one, we're adding another zero, but it's always staying at nine. So, so you're saying for four digit numbers, there should be 9,000. 9, for five digits numbers, there should be um, 90,000. So, what is the equation that we could do? Does, did anyone figure out the equation? So, if n is our number, then the number of digits for n is going to equal <clears throat> the, the, the number of n digit numbers? That number of n digit right. numbers. So I'm seeing nine times and then some power of 10 because it, it'll be something times 10. So, so the way we would probably want to do that is using an exponent nine times 10 and raised then, to a power. Because it's not just nine times 10, we need to be able to figure out, because if we just said n equals nine times 10, then the number of digits for n would always be 90. And obviously that's not that's not true here or here. So we have to have it raised to something so that then we're including n. So that it looks like the number of zeros is always one less than the number of digits. Yeah. So see here, how many zeros do we have? Zero, to zero zeros, and that's less than one. How many zeros do we have here? One, and that's one less than two. How many zeros do we have here? Two, and that's one less than three. So here is our formula to answer this for any case, which is really pretty awesome. N, the number of digits for, you know, N, N that have N is going to be nine times 10 to the N minus one. So the question came in, why, why are there not 99 two digit numbers? Why are there not 99 two digit numbers? Because there, there are 99 positive numbers below 100. So maybe you can clarify. That's a good question. So we do have 99 numbers below 100, but nine of those, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to be specific, those are all one digit. Uh, so we don't want to count. And we don't want to count numbers. those because they were, were only, we want two digit numbers, numbers that have two digits. So you take 99 minus nine, and then that gives you 90. That makes sense. Good question. Real quick, any other questions in the, in the chat? All right. So that is the answer to our math puzzle from yesterday. And then for our quick geometry lesson today, I want to talk a little bit about triangles. So since I'm math mom today, <clears throat> we will have a lesson on triangles. There are different types of triangles and some of them have special names that are pretty cool. If you have a triangle that has equal sides, three equal sides, this is equal to this, is equal to this, all the same, that is called an equilateral triangle. Equilateral triangle. And then if you have a triangle with my favorite angle, a 90 degree angle, that is called a right triangle. And we often draw a little box right here to show that it is a right angle. So here is a right triangle. Can a right triangle be an equilateral triangle? Can a right triangle be an equilateral triangle is a great question. And the answer is no. Because in an equilateral triangle, just like our line always added up to 180 degrees, all of the angles need to add up to 180, 180 degrees. degrees as well. And so if these angles are equal, because if the sides are equal, the angles are going to be equal, then we know each of these angles has to be what? Tell me in the chat really quick if you know. If these need to add up to 180, so this plus this plus this equals 180, and they've all got to be equal, what is my angle going to be in an equilateral triangle? Oh, no, it looks like my chat froze. And oh, well, I, I'll help you out then. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Someone's going to get it. So I saw someone say 30. If we have 30 plus 30 is 90 plus 30 again, 
would be 120. So 30 is not going to work. Uh, oh, now we're going. So Quaid, Samantha, um, Amy, Kimberly, lots and lots of people, 60. And I saw um, Science Dad just... What did I say? Did I say 30 plus 30 is? You said 30 plus 30 is 90. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's okay. Yep. Three thirties is going to be 90, which is too small, but three sixties is 180. So you can never have a right triangle be an equilateral triangle. Uh, you can't have a 90 degree angle. G could you use that formula to figure out the, the other two angles in a right triangle? Um, I think you could. Well, Let's try it out. Maybe, maybe so, only if they... If they're equal. Ah, okay. So if we know that this angle is a right angle, it's 90 degrees. And then if this angle is equal to that angle, then we would have 90 degrees plus some number that is the same here and here equals 180. Wow. How would we figure that out? It's a little high. You can't quite see it. <clears throat> well, we could just think to ourselves, let's see. I need to take, because 90 plus 90 equals 180. And if I need two numbers that are going to add up to 90, then I just take 90 divided by 2, which is 45. So that's one way we could figure that out. 90 plus 45 plus 45 equals 180. Aha. Uh -huh. So, but, but not all right triangles will have 45 and 45 as their other two angles? No, because they might, they might be shaped like this. So uh, you might have a right triangle that's shaped like that, or you might have one that's shaped like that. They could have different shapes. Is, is there a name for an, a triangle where the two angles are equal? Is that isosceles? <laughs> he's trying to mouth. He's trying to mouth the answer to me. <laughs> so he asked the question, "Is there a name for that?" And then he's saying, he's "Trying to <laughs> whisper it really quietly." Yes, I did remember that. Isosceles means that two of the angles are equal, but not the third one. So on our 90, 45, 45 triangle, it would be an isosceles triangle because those two angles would be would be equal. And I have to say, it's been a long time since I've taught a math lesson. Give some, should give some claps in the chat if you think that um, it's nicer when math dad does the math lesson. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there other types of triangles? Um, I'm sure there are other types of yeah, triangles. Okay. We, we, we might want to revisit that topic. Yes, we will, time. we will come back to geometry another time yeah. and do more with geometry, but. Well, fun. Thank you, Math Mom, for the, the, the lesson. Let me grab this. Do we have any jokes, I wonder? We do, and our jokes today came from some of our viewers. Ooh. So the first joke is from Rachel, who is from Oregon, and she says, what is Math Dad's favorite kind of pie? <sighs> what is Math Dad's favorite kind of pie? So is it the... What's the, the number? 3.14159? It is. Yeah. It is. Good job, Math Dad. <laughs> I just keep going through all these flavors. Like, which of those is mathy? But then I've got pi is itself. Is already itself. Yep. So, yeah, P, P I is how you spell it, the, the Greek letter. Then Hayden, who is 11 years old, suggests this joke, which is a great one. What do you call a superhero particle? What do you call a superhero particle? Uh, super particle. Uh, Particle man, particle, uh, I don't think know, of, help me. Um, think of Tony Stark, that might help you out. Iron particle, Iron Man, Iron, Particle I Man. Ion Man. Ion Man. Ion oh. Man. That was a fantastic <laughs> joke, Hayden. Thanks for submitting those. And if you would like to submit a joke, I'll just bring up real fast our um, album on the Facebook page. Down here in questions, we have a questions tab. You can submit questions there, but that's also a great place to share well, jokes or riddles. So, and okay, so, so since I'm not on Facebook, I don't know how any of this works, but so there are different things they can submit each time, the engineering challenges. So I put the, all of the prompts for our engineering challenges and our drawing, um, drawing prompts into a folder, into an album, and then you just click on the image and you can comment your picture. So that's, if you have Facebook, that's how you can submit your images. And that's also where you can ask questions if you want. All right, so, so that, that is the default hub for that's, any- That's where most of them come in. But if you don't have Facebook, you can also use Instagram or you can email us. Um, but the, the main place is on Facebook. All right, well, well done, Math Mom. Thank you. All right, it's time for Q&A, questions and answers. Jump back to the, the comments so that we can see that. We did have, um, ooh. And I yep. just lost it. We did have a good question that came in. <laughs> Come right. on, Science Mom. 
Kristen, right. pull that up. I saw one. This is an interesting question. Can you actually power a car with lemons? That's a great question. You guys may have seen the little science demonstration where you can power a little light with a lemon by using zinc and copper strips that you put in. And then because the lemon has water in it, it will connect and close that circuit. You're essentially making a tiny little battery. But the amount of power that you get from putting iron and zinc together and then making a circuit is really small. So it's enough to turn on a tiny little LED light, not enough to power a car or, or move a car. It'd be a big lemon. It's not the size of the lemon that matters. No? No, like, because you, you, you could lots put, of different Yeah, I mean, you could put it into a, a tomato. You could just, like, dip it into water. Like, anything that closes the circle will work. Yeah, but it's if you, if you got of, enough of them if, in, if, in sequence. And... Enough, like, zinc and... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds very difficult. All right. All right. All right. What do you call a polygon with nine sides? Ooh. A nonagon? A nonagon is correct. Man, math, math mom, mom knows her stuff. That's right. So eight sides, you've got an octagon. Nine is a nonagon. And ten is a... Decagon? Decagon. Good job. Are you trying to give me the hint again? Yeah, I was trying to Decagon. give the hint. Talk out of the side of my <laughs> mouth. Yeah. The screen's so small, they can't tell I'm talking. I, I think they can totally tell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got a question for science, Dad. Why is it called a Milky Way galaxy? Ooh, why is it called a Milky Way? Because of the delicious, yummy milk. No, I'm a lactose intolerant. No, it's it's a uh, it's it's because when you look up at the the sky, and you actually have to be away from the city lights to, to see the Milky Way very well. But uh, it it looks kind of whitish. There actually seems to be something of a band in the sky. If you can see. Uh, almost a milky, whitish, it's like lighter stripe. No, there there is. There's a stripe. And what we're actually seeing is the arm of the galaxy. So galaxies, just like um, our solar system, it sort of exists on a plane where the sun is in the middle and then the planets are all orbiting around and it kind of makes a disk. Galaxies are the same way because there will be heavy objects in the middle of the galaxy that everything else is orbiting around. And our sun is one of those things that's orbiting the heavier thing in the middle of the Milky Way. And Super massive black hole. Yeah. And so with the galaxy itself, most of the stars and the other solar systems are all in this flat disc-shaped pattern. And so when you look at the sky, you're going to see that arm of stars, and that's the Milky Way. That's our own galaxy that you're seeing when you see that stripe of stars that are lighter or all look like they're clustered together. It's something that's difficult to see if you live by a big city. So we live close to Las Vegas, which is like the number one of the number one light polluting places in, in the world in terms of how much light it puts out. And so we actually, I can only see a few constellations from our, our house when I look up in the sky, just barely, I can see the constellations. And if we want to see stars and want to see the Milky Way, we have to drive two and a half hours away before we get away from that, that light that you see in Vegas. So somebody asking in the chat, could you get hit by a falling star? Yes. Um, your chances of getting hit by a meteorite or a meteor are very, very small because most of them get, you know, it's, so meteors that are coming into our solar system, most of them go to Jupiter because it's like the vacuum cleaner of our solar system. And then the few that get past Jupiter, most of them are small enough that they burn up in the atmosphere. So you would see a shooting star or you would see, you know, a fireball, but you're, it's not going to touch the ground. So I would say they're, they're not going to get sucked up by Jupiter necessarily. Ju Jupiter's way off on one side. If they happen it to is. go near Jupiter, it's going to go. But but most of the approach, I mean, they're, they're heading in towards the, the sun it is a default orbit. So I'd... Oh, it's true. Okay. So Jupiter doesn't suck up all of them, but it does, it does a significant portion. Okay. Um, and then meteors that land on the Earth, the Earth is big enough and it's really is kind of random where they hit. So the chances of an actual person being hit by a meteor are very small. So... My family had a farm oh, in, in, in Idaho, a story. and we had, but behind some hills, we had this dry farm, so we couldn't get water back there, so we just grow whatever we could, but when my grandpa drove back one day, there was some smoke, and he, so we went back, and there was this crater there, and it had kind of smashed into the side of the hill, and then down below, it burned all the way down the hill for, for another or 200 feet and boy you thought oh, that was crazy and we watched that for, for years and slowly the craters kind of filled itself in a bit but it took 
probably 10 or 15 years before plants would grow on that hill again. I, I think the temperatures had just gotten so high that it kind of sterilized the, the soil and nothing would even grow. And even when plants did come back, they were different than the other plants. So that, that, that was so, kind of cool. I remember when we, yeah, when we were dating, when we first met, um, we went up driving up there and he, he showed me like, this is where the meteor was. And it was really cool to see. So you could still see, you could still see the little path and then kind of a small crater, not, not really big. I'd say, I'd say the path wasn't more than like 20 feet long. And then the crater was maybe four or five feet wide. Is that about? Yeah. Five, five, six feet. I, I, yeah. I, I remember it being much bigger as a kid. Although I can't tell if that was just my memory or because I was smaller at the time, but but yeah, it make, makes me wonder, like, is there a little tiny marble sized meteorite down there if we were to dig around? And I honestly don't know. So we got a good question from Hayden. She says, have you ever made what you think an alien looks like? And that is a great question. So we're, we're currently watching Star Trek as a family <laughs> and we've had some fun conversations about, you know, different species that people encounter in Star Trek. And if you did find life on another planet, would it look like that? And I, I think that most likely if we find life on another planet, the first type of life we would discover most likely would be small, like bacteria or maybe small photosynthetic organisms. Probably we would find those first. But it is really fun to think about what other life could be. Because if you look back in time, like to the fossil record of things that were evolving on Earth, you can see areas where there's one type of life that gets to be super abundant, like trilobites. And then there will be things will change and that type of life is not as abundant. But what if trilobites had kept going? What if that had become the dominant life form on earth? And what if like giant insect like creatures were, you know, writing books and, and doing things? It's really fun to think about. So favorite type of aliens that I like to sort of daydream about, um, pentapetal, because starfish have kind of like this five point symmetry. And I like to kind of imagine like, what if the five point symmetry sort of became the main thing it's kind of fun to think about um uh, that is weird. Yeah. yeah maybe maybe we can do like a drawing prompt later on where we yeah. take that one further so i'm seeing a math problem that keeps showing up what is n plus six equals y well it's unless there's some hidden joke in there uh there are actually infinitely many possible solutions so for different values of n you can get a different value of y so i, I won't be able to give you a very satisfying answer, I think. Is that, that just because there's not enough information? You have two variables and you only have one that, that, That's right. One so th th there won't be just one solution. It'll turn out, if you were to, to graph the solutions, you'd get an entire line in the plane, infinitely many of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's kind of cool. How many atoms are there in the world is a good question that Jane, Jane just posed. So we can estimate the number of atoms by measuring how many atoms there are, let's say, in, in salt water. So you could take a cup of salt water and then estimate, okay, how much does this weigh? and we know the density of water, and you can extrapolate out and try and estimate the number of atoms in the world. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's it's huge. But it's it's not as big as a Google. We, yes. we know that there aren't even a Google atoms in the entire universe. Yeah, it's probably on the range of like one, 10 one, to the 40th power. In the in the Facebook album, one, one of our viewers yesterday wrote out a Google. They wrote one with 100 zeros. It looked really cool nice. on a blackboard. <laughs> Hand gets tired after writing that many zeros. It, it is a lot of zeros. What would a velocity of a baseball on the moon be? So if you were on the moon and you threw, and then you were playing a game of catch, would the ball travel faster? So that's a really good question. So the original force on the ball, you're throwing and releasing. So you're the one that's actually supplying all of that force. So you wouldn't be able to throw the ball any harder on the moon than on the earth. However, the way that the ball would fall, it would still follow, follow a parabolic arc, but because of the, the acceleration due to gravity is much less on the moon, it, it wouldn't fall down as fast. So you'd be able to throw the ball further. Yes. Although it, the actual velocity, the speed at which it was traveling, so the speed, yeah, wouldn't the, be higher. Yeah, than the speed on would not be higher, but it would fall slower because there is a little bit less gravity and it would travel further at higher speed. It would slow down slower because there isn't as much air resistance. And so, you know, you don't have the air resistance factor. So yep. it would definitely go farther. It would not go faster. Good question. Really good question. How do you calculate pi? Ooh. Go ahead, math mom. How do we calculate <laughs> pi? Oh no. So you calculate pi. Where's our, where's our ball? <clears throat> Pi is the ratio between two things, the circumference 
of the circle, that's when you measure it around, and the diameter, how far across it is, so or the height. So that's how you calculate pi. You take the height and the circumference, and you divide height by circumference, I think? Circumference by height. Circumference by height. It's a good thing I have a science dad here to give me hints. <laughs> and, and, and that will work for any circle? Any circle. Uh, any circle. It's pretty cool. It was like a 3.14159-ish. That's right. That's right. And then um, are there more atoms in the universe or than a Google? And this is the cool thing about the number Google. The number Google is so big. And we can write it out. We can write one with 100 zeros out. But if you actually tried to count that high, there's no possible way that you could do it. In fact, I, um, I'll, I'll try and post a little graphic online later because uh, a couple years ago we did, we made a nice little chart of how long it would take you to count to a certain number if you were counting one number per second. And you can get to a million in about a week, two weeks. Yeah, about six, six days, I think it was. Yeah, and then if you go higher, a billion takes you more than a month. And then if you go to a trillion, you're talking years. And before you know it, you're up 30 to- 30 years. Yeah, 30 years to count to a billion. And then when you get higher than that, you're getting into centuries and a Google is like, you know, ridiculous. There's no way that, you know, you could count that high at all. Could you play soccer on the moon? And the answer there is, well, yeah. I mean, so you got to, if we ignore the space suits, that would make it pretty awkward. It would, it would make it difficult, <laughs> um, but you totally could. Yeah. So, I mean, could you kick the ball so high that it just kept going forever and ever? Well, we're not that strong. Um, but it could happen on the moon that you could, but yeah, you could have it, it, it is possible if things got launched hard enough. Yeah, they, they would escape the, and the, then, the gravity. Or the, yeah, they would keep going forever. Um, question, what is the universe made of? So mostly empty space. And this is really sort of a cool thing to think about and a weird thing, thing to think about. An atom is mostly empty space. The universe is mostly empty space. Remember our our little diagram of the solar system, we said if we actually wanted to take these pl eight planets and then space them out, how they're spaced in space, make it proportional, we'd have to do this over more than a kilometer. Like you'd have to be a, a mile away from Mercury to Neptune, which is kind of crazy. So mostly yeah. the universe is made of empty space. Second, the universe is made of hydrogen. Hydrogen is by far the most abundant element. And then after that you have helium, and then you kind of work down the line. The other elements that are heavier, you have less of, but you do have places where they're more abundant, like Earth. You know, on Earth, we have a lot of water. We have a lot of silicon and other material that make up the rocky core of our planet, nickel and iron. But mostly, if you're looking at the universe as a whole, it's mostly empty. And inside that emptiness is mostly hydrogen. That's right. Which is really pretty cool. <laughs> All right. One last little thing I want to mention is about our chat. So we love seeing the energy and the discussion back and forth in the chat, but there are two, two little quick things that I wanna mention. First is an internet safety tip, because I know a lot of you guys are going to be spending more time online, and if you're talking online with someone in a chat, you might start to feel like you get to know them, but really, do you know them very well if you've had a little bit of a banter back and forth? You really don't. They might say that they're a seven-year-old kid, they might be a 65-year-old um, hippopotamus. You don't know. You don't know. So <laughs> it's important in, in, in our chat too, if you ever say like, I want your phone number or like give me your email address or let's meet up in real life, Science Mom Liza, Krista and Emily will block it and remove that comment right away. So our chat is not a place to try and meet other people or form those connections. There are other places online where you can meet and make new friends online. And then the second thing is that um, oftentimes towards the end, I will see that a couple kids will try to start a little war going back and forth. And if that does get too out of hand, the science mom, Liza and um, Krista and Emily, they do have the ability to just turn the chat off completely. That, that would and be pretty so, sad. If we didn't have any sad. chat, we wouldn't have any interaction. But but yeah, if, if people are feeling like others are being mean, then the only safe thing to do is to well, stop whatever we were doing and don't, don't play that game. Yep. Um, so we, so we, we do love the questions though. Yeah, so, and and, and I, I enjoy the sort of the games that happen back and forth too, as long as they don't get out of hand. So if it gets if it gets too out of hand, then um, we can just turn off the chat, but we don't ever wanna have it get to there. So please listen to, especially on, on YouTube, please listen to Emily and Liza. And if they tell you to like, hey, you know, no more repeated questions or no more, you know, whatever it is that's, that's happening with the little the little jokes going back and forth. Make sure you listen to them. And then we are we are just about out of time. But I I did see um, a request for someone to to sing a song. 
And I, I think do, there... you, do you know a song? Yeah. Well, what, what song do you know? <laughs> I know a song that is going to be stuck in your head all day, <laughs> all day. You'll never get it out of your head. I'm singing a song and I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it wrong. And I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> Thank you very much for nice. joining us on this April Fool's Day. And we hope that you have a wonderful April Fool's yourself. And remember, oh no, where did it go? My triangle paper. Uh, it's, here it is. It's here. So we got the, the drawing prompt so, yes. was? The drawing prompt was to draw shadow art. So trace a shadow and then you can color it in. Try to be realistic. So like if you have a toy dinosaur, you could trace the shadow of your twin dinosaur and then color it in. Or you can go abstract whatever direction you want. And then remember to take a look at this vanishing puzzle piece. Well, and the, and the, see cool, if you the cool thing about this is it will fool your parents too. They won't know the answer most likely. So yeah, if you really want a good head scratcher, this is it. Yes. Yep. It's a fantastic one. All right. Stay safe and we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.